let's go ahead and start. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. I am Merle Collins, director of the Latin American Studies Center, LASC, which is hosting this discussion today. Welcome, welcome to what I know will be a thought provoking presentation by an excellent scholar. <laughs> we are fortunate to have as our presenter, Dr. Sandy Saipes. Professor Emerita, University of Maryland, who is no stranger to last. We are very pleased to have you on our community, Professor Saipes. A full introduction of Professor Saipes will be done by Dr. Lisa Carney, Latin American Studies Center postdoctoral associate, who will also be moderating the discussion. Dr. Carney is not only the last postdoctoral associate, she's also coordinator of the dissertation success program for the University of Maryland's Graduate School Writing Center. Her research interests include indigenous cultural production, contemporary Latin American literature, and the language narratives of Quechua from the Andes and Amazon region. Dr. Carney is a May 2020 graduate of the university's Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Dr. Carney will now introduce Dr. Saipas. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Uh, today, it is my sincerest pleasure to be introducing uh, an esteemed former professor of mine, Sandra Messinger Saipas. And we were chatting before this began. Just one year ago today, she was zooming in for my dissertation defense. So I'm just thrilled we should do that every year. <laughs> After over 45 years of university teaching, Sandra Messinger Saipas retired as a full professor of Latin American literatures and an affiliate in the Latin American Studies Program, Women's Studies Program, Comparative Literatures, Performance Studies, and Classics at the University of Maryland. She was chair of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese for five years, uh, ending in 2005 and then again in 2010. Her major research interests include Mexican cultural studies, Latin American theater and performance, and gender studies. In addition to six books, over 70 book chapters and articles, and well over 100 scholarly presentations, Dr. Sipas was also co-editor of the drama section for the Handbook of Latin American Studies. Since retiring, Dr. Sipas has continued to be active, as, we, as I said, even being on the dissertation committee. Uh, her book, Uncivil Wars, Elena Garro, Octavio Paz, and the Battle for Cultural Memory, first published by the University of Texas Press in 2012, was translated into Spanish and published by the editorial Veracruzana, which plans to publish the Spanish version of La Malinche in Mexican literature from history to myth. She's appointed a consultant to the Denver Museum's first ever exhibition on representations of La Malinche, and her essay to be included in the exhibition catalog is The Many Views of Mother Malinche, and allegories of gender, ethnicity, and national identity. Mm -hmm. The website of UNAM published her essay, Malintzin Doña Marina La Malinche, this February 2021. Her essay, Approaching the Caribbean from a Latin Americanist perspective, appeared in Reimagining the Caribbean, Conversations Among Creole, French, and Spanish Caribbean, published by Lexington Books in 2014, which she co-edited with Valerie Orlando, also of Maryland and which will be reprinted, reprinted in a new edition of the canonical Out of the Cumbla, edited, edited by Elaine Fido and Carol Boyce Davies for its 30th anniversary reissue. So Dr. Seifus, it's a pleasure to have you speak with us today. I'm certainly looking forward to this opportunity to learn from you. And I would like to remind all of our um, attendees that you may please type your questions in the Q&A function of this meeting and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Okay, well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for the lovely introduction and thank you, Meryl, too, for the invitation, which was supposed to take place a year ago, right around the time of Lisa's thesis defense. And so here we are uh, with a year of pandemic, but not wasted for a lot of us. And, I'm happy to be able to share with you these ideas after my long career as a Latin Americanist. And again, I, before we start, I'd like all of you to think about what you think of these terms that are in the title for this presentation, a Latin American, 
Caribbean American? What do they mean to you? What do you cover with these terms? Because as a professor of literature, I'm always interested in titles and signs and meanings. And so again, I, I wonder how we all come to these terms now and how do we begin to change our ideas about these things? The book that Lisa mentioned has a, just a lovely uh, cover uh, from Joseph Kankeva Pady. And we talked very much about what it is reimagining the Caribbean. It all came about, I should tell you, when Valerie and I were uh, eager to share our interests in the idea of the Caribbean. And we organized with the help of the graduate school, uh, the first graduate seminar, I think, that combined French and Spanish. And we did a text in French, Spanish, and the Anglophone Caribbean as well. And out of that, we decided to uh, organize a round table at MLA in 2013, which we did. And when we put out the call for papers, we were so surprised that very few people who had topics of Hispanic Caribbean entered, and that got us thinking. So we organized the best presentations into this anthology, and I wrote the chapter, Approaching the Caribbean from a Latin Americanist perspective. So I asked the question, you know, that I think many of you who are starting out, I'm eager to let you know too, that you have to be thinking about these things. How does a professor who is a Latin Americanist deal with the Caribbean? Is that sentence perhaps employing a tautology? Is the term Latin American inclusive of Caribbean? Or is it making a distinction that is not only knowledgeable and clever, but necessary? Where does the Caribbean fit into the Latin American? And so those were the kinds of things that I began to explore in my essay. And I think perhaps I should say that how I started it all, maybe going back even further, that I grew up in a neighborhood in which Spanish, Italian, and Yiddish was spoken. And that could well have been Buenos Aires, but it was actually Brooklyn. And when I started in Brooklyn, New York, I had wonderful mentors and so I majored in Spanish. And that meant reading only from peninsular texts. I had told my college professors I wanted to read more of Latin America. And they said, yes, yes, you could do that. But first you should really know Spanish literature. So that is what I did. I did not get to really read and delve into Latin American uh, literature until graduate school because people hadn't even heard of the boom yet when I started. It was sort of in the, on the horizon. So I had to you know, learn about Latin American literature as a graduate student. And of course that continued throughout my career. And what I found is that it all depends on who's reading and who the audience is, how the language of the Latin America is determined. When I started, the uh, professors were mostly from Argentina, Mexico, Chile. Uh, the idea was to allow Cuba into the uh, reading list as well with Alejo Carpentier because of the boom. But we never read works from Central America, perhaps just Darío because he was you know, accepted on nothing much about women writers. So these, these words have increased and increased in uh, their scope as we go on. And I'd like to start now, uh, Eric, with uh, number one, first share. So we'll start with that and see what it says. Okay, so here. As I discuss the various meanings of the sign in this essay, my observations relate mostly to the configuration of Latin American studies and Latin American and Caribbean studies as the field has been practiced in US universities, directed to a diverse body of students at those universities. For those in the field, I do not need to convince you of the complications and challenges involved in discussing the nature of Latin American and Caribbean studies because of the inherent cultural, racial, and geographical differences that exist in the very multifaceted region. Moreover, there is no consensus among scholars as to which countries comprise the area of these designations. In the 1985 issue of Caribbean Review, Andres Sermon penned an essay with provocative title, The Non-Existent Caribbean. 
Serbin recounts an anecdote from an international conference of Latin American politicians and academics during which the question was posed. Why should we refer to Latin America and the Caribbean as separate entities if the Caribbean does not exist? Well, perhaps um, we would have to say, there's supposed to be another page, but I guess, yes. Perhaps that's why a canonical writer of the Caribbean, Antonio Benitez Rojo, drew upon chaos theory as a way to approach his analysis of the Caribbean in La Isla Que Se Repite of 1989, translated into English as the Repeating Islands, 1994. As Edna Eisenberg clearly summarized in her review of the English translation, the Caribbean, marked by multiple instabilities, fractured land masses, hurricanes, genocides, colonialism, appears to be fruitful ground for a metaphoric use of chaos. Benitez Rojo chooses the trope of the repeating island to indicate that amidst the vertigo of Caribbean heterogeneity, there is a sameness that proliferates endlessly. Each copy of the island is both like and unlike the other. The repeating island is not any Caribbean island familiar to us, but rather a construct that allows Benitez Rojo to explore the constancies and contradictions of the archipelago. Bueno, despite Benitez Rojo's undertaking to reconsider the Caribbean beyond, ah, un momento, <laughs> I just, beyond the, um, finish, uh, beyond, the traditional geographical and national boundaries, the term is still in limbo, if not meshed in chaos. And that was in the 1990s. And it seems in a sense to, thank you, Eric, I'll go on, that we have to um, consider, is there a chaos? Is there any kind of consistency? Well, one thing I started to do then is to look at what other programs in the different universities of the United States have done about the idea of the Caribbean. And so we can go to uh, slide two. I went through all the different, uh, different programs because just as we speak of social construction of gender and ethnicity, a social construction of Latin America and the Caribbean occurred in the US Academy of the 20th century. One might recall that it was not until the 19th century that the French invented the name Latin America as a result of the expansionist plans of Napoleon III. He not only attempted to uh, put on the pro-French monarch in Mexico, Maximilian, but he also wanted to ensure the name of the region reflected the French presence that the previous terms such as Hispanic America or Ibero-America did not. And I found that through my going through the various uh, programs in the different universities that I just saw that diversity. <laughs> I'll start with Binghamton University where I spent almost 20 years and I was director of what was called the Latin American and Caribbean Area Studies. The Caribbean was added after the program had been established as a way to highlight the insertion of Caribbean into the academic and research agenda of the faculty, but also because Binghamton was a school that had a very large population of Puerto Ricans and then later Dominicans. And I think that that was an important impetus to make the change. At the University of Maryland, where I spent another 20 odd years, 20 good years, Latin American Studies Center was the title. And the first sentence, however, of the introduction asks, interested in understanding and exploring Latin America and the Caribbean? So one may assume then that the UMD Center uses Latin America at that point in time as an all-inclusive term. At Cornell University, where I received my master's, Latin American Studies Program is what it's called. And the website shows that for them, Latin America includes Caribbean countries. But to make sure that the reader knows this, they clarify the point. They call it LAS, Latin American Studies Program, welcomes Cornell undergraduates and graduates in all fields of study who are interested in studying and conducting research in Latin America or the Caribbean, and they should apply for the minor there. So you notice how even if the title says one thing, then the introduction adds that Caribbean. 
Now we go to New York City itself. At NYU, their center is the Latin American and Caribbean studies as well. At SUNY Stony Brook, it's Latin American and Caribbean studies too, which serves to enhance and focus the interests of students, faculty, graduate students, and the larger New York regional community concerned with Latin American and Latino issues. They put that in. So it's not a coincidence that although the program places equal weight on Latin American and Caribbean, Stony Brook should add Latino as a descriptor, where other programs would include Caribbean itself. Again, my sense is that this is New York and the population in that, the, the greater metropolitan area is heavily Caribbean. Fordham University was once a Puerto Rican studies institute, then changed its name to the broader Latin American and Latino studies institute. So for them, the Caribbean need not be named, but is assumed as part of both Latin America and Latino. Now I go to Florida. Florida in Gainesville University. Their research center is called simply Center for Latin American Studies. And yet it is one of the largest centers in the United States for the study of Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino studies. Its library has a vast Caribbean collection and its press is known to have an extensive list of texts on a wide variety of works on the Caribbean, Anglophone, Francophone, and Hispanic topics. So I thought that was interesting that they don't say that in their title. Florida International University in Miami boasts one of the largest concentrations of Latin American and Caribbean studies scholars of any university in the country, they say, and spans a multitude of disciplines. Their center is called the Latin American and Caribbean Center. And its goal is to promote the study of Latin America and the Caribbean in Florida and throughout the United States. I ask, could it be that that huge number of residents with ties to Cuba and Haiti influenced the inclusion of Caribbean, just as it might have for SUNY Stony Brook? Not all programs feel the need to make the distinction that the Caribbean is separate from Latin America, as in the case with the University of Miami, situated in the same city as FIU, although the goal of their Center of Latin American Studies is to integrate the energies, ideas, and experiences of, what, get the next page, of scholars, students, and other individuals who share a common while diverse interest in Latin America and the Caribbean. We know that Caribbean is not a separate term in their name. And I have to say, I keep on switching back and forth, Caribbean, Caribbean, Caribe. <laughs> I think it's interesting that I use the multiplicity of, of uh, words. In New Mexico, we go into this, now we're heading towards the West. What do they do? In New Mexico, which boasts of having the highest percentage of Hispanic or Latinos by population in the US, that's what they say, the University of New Mexico claims to have emphasized Latin American studies since the early 1930s. Because of its geographic location and unique cultural history, their program is called the Latin American and Iberian Institute. No mention of the Caribbean in their title or mission statement. They look to their Spanish Iberian heritage of their population. Interestingly, Caribbean topics there are sponsored by the Africana Center. Now to California, what do they do? The University of Southern California grouped its research and teaching program under the rubric of Latin American Studies Institute. For their purposes, the term Latin America refers to all of the Americas south of the United States, including Mexico, the countries of Central and South America, and the islands of the Caribbean. In UC Santa Barbara, Latin American and Iberian studies examines the peoples and cultures of Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries throughout the world. Not only Spain, Portugal, and Latin America, but also Angola, Mozambique, the Philippines, Macau, and the Chicano and Puerto Rican populations in the US. Faculty with a Caribbean focus seem to be housed in the Black Studies Department and one assumes that the focus is on the Anglophone aspects of the Caribbean, but no mention is made of languages. At UC Berkeley, it's simply the Center for Latin American Studies and no mention of the Caribbean. 
why I went into all of this is because it is fascinating as a US academic, what are the various universities doing in the different parts of the country? And you could see that there was a very strong interest in including Caribbean in the East. And that makes sense because of the population. So now I look at my notes. <laughs> it's interesting that when we come to the language issue, again, that was something that was mentioned in some of the programs. I looked up to find, talk about languages. And if you want to know what is the most spoken language in Latin America, Lisa will not be surprised because first they list languages that are indigenous to the area and Quechua with its 8 million people. And my certainly my colleague, Dr. Regina Harrison and Lisa would both agree that that makes sense. I thought it was interesting that when you want to look at the 10 most spoken immigrant languages, Spanish is number one. But the interesting contrast for me is what are the languages that were native to this area, to this geographical area versus the immigrant languages. And so there we have the idea that when we talk about languages, we seem to think that Spanish is you know, this native language or in the Caribbean, what languages are native to the, to the area? Well, nobody is speaking Arawako anymore. Right, And so we have this um, idea of what we impose as academics on what we think are the dominant areas and the dominant regions. Now, when you talk about the idea of, of what we see the name Caribbean and what we think, I was amazed at how many uh, books would use the word Caribbean and you open it up and it's only about one language, one area. And which, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, and here, for example, what would you think of a book entitled New Caribbean Poetry, an anthology? Well, if we are inclusive, we're thinking that it's going to cover a great many languages, but instead it does have eight different areas, but they are all English speaking Caribbean. So again, I have found that very often that has been the case, that the word Caribbean seems to be more used without a modifier if the language will be English and the poets and the writers are from the English speaking Caribbean. Now here's another example of a book which you can see emigration and Caribbean literature. Again, here there's no modifier about what Caribbean we're talking about. It's not inclusive. It is only the English and French that are dealt with in this book. And I, I saw a number of different cases. And again, I have come to many books looking at the title and not knowing really what Caribbean is going to mean. So we have to think about not only the books, but what's inside the book. And I found it fascinating too, to look about look at the writers and how they're treated. Now, I have been very concerned about writing about uh, women writers in general, and I have written a lot about Puerto Rican women writers. And I have to say that one of the things that I did to sort of break up suppositions is when I was invited to the Foreign Affairs Institute to speak to the uh, budding diplomats who were going off to Latin America. So I was asked to introduce them to the literature and take one story and discuss it. So what did I choose? You may not believe this, but I chose La Muñeca Menor de Rosario Castellanos, The Youngest Doll by Rosario. And many of the students said, well, 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 is she Latin American? And I go, well, you have to understand that Puerto Rico in its cultural heritage does have this relationship with lo hispano. And the story, of course, is a good example of el realismo mágico, the magical realism, which many people associate, of course, with Garcia Marquez and Latin America. So I was trying to break up their stereotypes. I was trying to show them that you have to have a very broad idea of what is uh, considered Latin America and what is considered the cultural heritage of a given person of a given country. 
And I did speak, of course, of Alessio Marquez, but I also wanted them to have a uh, less rigid idea of what Latin America is. And my role, in a sense, has been to try to do that, to not uh, have people think in stereotype terms. And so when I had a job interview, actually, at the University of Binghamton, <laughs> again, I spoke about a topic that was not part of the canon. And I uh, actually chose a, a Puerto Rican woman dramatist, Mirna Casas. And if I was standing up in front of you, I would show you the dance I did. Because in a sense, to talk about Puerto Rico in the canon would be going one step back. To talk about a woman writer would be going one step further back. And of course, to deal with a genre of drama, which is not one of the genres that is always used is to be like in Pluto. And so that's what I did as my job presentation and I did get the job. But I, again, I was trying to say that you, there's no set idea. You have, to, you have to justify what you're saying. Why are you saying she's part of a tradition that is Latin American being from Puerto Rico? And I was able to do that. But I've had those experiences throughout my career. And when I was able to be part of the um, canonical book now, Out of the Kumla, again, a title that did not use Caribbean per se, but the word Kumla, which had been used in a novel by Irma Broadbear, is the idea of coming out of almost like the briar patch. And so it was thought of as something being, the voices of women writers in that, in that anthology were coming out of the darkness and into the light because of the book. And they are celebrating their 30th anniversary this year. And now we're going on to, I found something fascinating too in my archival study. This time it was going into the Library of Congress and we can do the next classified numero cuatro. I think you'll find this very interesting because how do we describe the writers of Latin America and the Caribbean? Julio Portasar, interestingly enough, he was born in Brussels. He lived in France for many years, but of course he is always classified as an Argentine writer. Another contrast is Lucha Corti. She was born in Veracruz, Mexico, but she lives in California. She studied in California. And so she is designated as a Chicana writer. Now, what about Maris Conde? Maris Conde, who did teach at the University of Maryland, but before I got here, unfortunately. Now, your students will often go to Wiki, right? And so Wiki describes her as a French novelist, a French novelist, critic, and playwright from the French uh, um, universe, right? And the region of Guadalupe. So this is very interesting. She's not She's not designated as a Guadalupe writer, but as a French writer, because the Guadalupe is a French overseas department. Now, Condé is best known, they say, for her novels, and her novels explore the African diaspora that resulted from slavery and colonization in the Caribbean. But she was educated in France, and I think that made the difference in how they described her. And Rosario Ferre, and another writer who is um, also tied to the UMD, she received her PhD from the University of Maryland in our Department of Spanish and Portuguese. She is considered, according to the MLA standards, a Puerto Rican writer. But Amazon and Wiki also fi uh, file her as a Puerto Rican writer. And I think that was interesting. But the Library of Congress system, however, only uses some of her texts to be cataloged with other Puerto Rican writers. Surprisingly to me, House on the Lagoon and the eccentric neighborhoods in Flight of the Swan are classified as American lit literature under the PS category of the Library of Congress. Well, even the Spanish versions of those novels appear under the PS group. Perhaps because these latter novels were first written in English, they were erroneously cataloged as if they had been written perhaps by a New Yorican or an American. But there is no Puerto Rican American in a sense, because as you should know, and many of my students did not know, Puerto Ricans who are born and in, in, the, in Puerto Rico are Americans. They have American passports based on the Commonwealth status of the country. So. The novels that are shelved in a different location were first written in English. That's a fact. 
But even so, the themes of the books and their geographical settings are related to Puerto Rico and were written by a Puerto Rican. The confusion by the cataloger seems enigmatic in the way it disregards nationality, place of origin, and even the details of the texts. One may marvel at the power exercised by the English language. Now, Suzanne Césaire is described as a French writer born in Martinique, while her much more famous husband, the poet Aimé Césaire, is called a Francophone and Martinican poet, an Afro-Caribbean author and politician. So we get many different adjectives, but I thought it was interesting that she is only described as a French writer. Bueno, so what do we see about that idea? Is there any consensus, <laughs> even from the universities, the academics, even the Library of Congress, we find that there are so many different ways of approaching both Latin America and the Caribbean. So, I think that we have to, you know, understand what's going on and, and wonder if we will ever be able to come to a consensus. But my aim as a lifelong teacher and learner is to encourage us to get out of our comfort zone so we recognize the limits of our knowledge. And then we are less likely to rely on easy stereotypes or cultural cliches or bland conflations. We cannot even rely on some very important and significant um, websites. I'm not saying that Wiki is, but the last slide, please. And we'll see if I can close. I have number five is a link. Okay. So here is Lani. It's a, what is it called? A trusted internet portal for Latin American studies. And you see how they list the country. Do you notice anything about the countries of, um, let's see, Caribbean, Central America, they have all the countries listed in the Caribbean, but is there anything missing? Because it's interesting that in a way you can name the individual islands, but if we are talking about the Caribbean influence, and the Caribbean basin, we also have to include Veracruz, Mexico, which is on the Caribbean, and Honduras, and Belize, and Panama, and Colombia. So you see that you, we shouldn't just think in terms of geography, but we should think of the influences. Now, especially Veracruz has a lot in common with the Hispanic Caribbean. You know, and with the Caribbean in general, as far as the influx of African inhabitants in the country, for example, and the influence of Africa in the Veracruz culture. So we have to uh, just constantly be broadening, I think, our approach. And it would seem to me that even if you look at this um, careful directory, you will see that they didn't have it all. And so we must be constantly on guard. We must be able to explore and uh, decide at what point and how we are going to use these terms. So in a sense, that's sort of more my formal presentation going back and forth. And I, and I really look forward to hearing what you all have to say about these uh, terms and what you thought before you heard me speak about what the Caribbean was. So Lisa, do you have any, any questions? I don't see questions at the right this moment, but I will remind everyone now again if you would like to submit a question, there's the QA function at the bottom of your screen where you can write in a question. Yeah, I see some chat on the bottom of mine. Yes, and there's some chats too. Um, yeah, there's some chat. Mm -hmm. It is interesting to me how, how much this is such a common debate just this week in my um, class we had I had students watch a video that was on YouTube and it was about LGBTQ movements in Latin America was the title and this is a video that um, they had experts come in and one expert was coming in to talk about Mexico and another expert was coming in to talk about Jamaica and in the comment section underneath the first comment was Jamaica is not Latin America <laughs> and so it was just very appropriate at this time, but we're seeing maybe where, where these things are debated in social media too. Right. 
I'm sure more and more this will be a debate. I mean, how do we talk about, I mean, is the Spanish Caribbean and the Francophone Caribbean going to be different from the English Caribbean? You know, English is also a, a language from Latin. It has a lot of Latin roots, so it might be called under Latin America as well. And again, the countries, as Benitez Rojo was trying to um, affirm, the islands are all very different, but yet they have similarities. You know, certainly the colonialism and, and uh, certainly the weather, <laughs> you know, dealing not only with this great weather that brings all the cruise ships, I think it's very interesting that, you know, people, I have a friend who went to the different Caribbean uh, islands on a cruise and she goes, I don't know, they all seem alike, there's just flowers and there's no sense when people go on a cruise to what is the unique value of these different islands. And, and I think that's a real problem today as the Caribbean is such an important uh, cruise destination, you know. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's something that we as academics and students of this area have to point out. And there's a very interesting short story that I would recommend if you haven't read it, Encan Cara Nublado by Ana Lidia Vega. It's a tough title to translate. Uh, Storm a brewing could be one translation. I think there is one translation in English, but she talks about how the various people coming to America from Haiti and Dominican Republic and Cuba all get in the same boat and they all show their differences. But once they get to the States, they're all considered, you know, the same. And as either she uses in the term six, which is again, you know, a disrespectful, and it doesn't seem to be used anymore, thankfully, but it was used for her purposes to show the contrast between the people coming from the Caribbean who want to keep their, dis their distinctiveness and yet are seen to be all the same. I know. I have a few questions now. Um, from Maria okay. Roof, do you consider Caribbean mainly the areas that received a significant number of enslaved Africans? Is that what we think of as, as the uh, Caribbean? I think that that's not just only the Caribbean, of course, but it's true of, of Me you know, Mexico and even Uruguay. One of my dear friends, Juana Maria Cordones Cook has done so much work on the African influence in Uruguay, which you would ordinarily not think of, right? As part of the Southern Cone. So, I think that the idea of uh, just Spain and maybe France and uh, you know, in the late times, the US, but the idea of the African influence is certainly very strong in the Caribbean, but it is strong in other parts of the um, Southern hemisphere as well, Latin America in general. Thank you, let's see the uh, next question uh, from Gabrielle Robinson to Lindbergh. Should we think about the emphasis on Latin, uh, in quotation marks, um, and colonial languages? Okay, so let me start this over. Should we think about the emphasis on Latin and colonial languages and erasure of indigenous and African genealogy and influence? Well, I think that it does say that, doesn't it? I mean, just uh, last year before the pandemic, I was in Oaxaca and the uh, international fair there, the book fair, was stressing the importance of all the various languages that are still vibrant and vital in Mexico. Well, at least as a wonderful example of the fact that Quechua is such an important and vital language. And so, when, yeah, when we talk about Latin America, we'll look at the word Indio, for example. There was Columbus thinking he was off to the Indies. He used the word Indio, and from now on, that is what has been used. And then the idea of the West Indies for the part of the Caribbean, that too, as a title, brings us back to the colonial expansion of Europe, but it doesn't at all reflect the indigenous population. And that's why I brought up that the most, uh, let's say the most popular language in South America, if you're talking about native, is Quechua and not Spanish. Spanish is an immigrant language. And so what are we to do about these words? It's just like this now, there's a great push in the idea of Mexico and the conquest, because this is the year of the 500th anniversary 
of the fall of Tenochtitlan, 1521 to 2021. And a number of historians are saying we should not talk about the conquest, we should talk about the invasion because the native languages has, have not been erased. They are still vibrant in many parts of Mexico, many parts of the Latin America as well. And so what do we use? What term do we use? We, a term is chosen and is um, propagated before Latin America it was called Spanish America. I, then because of Brazil, Ibero-America. French Guiana is just a little tiny place. But notice how Napoleon III was able to impose this idea that we should consider the Latin language. I'm surprised he didn't say Romance America, as we know Romance languages. <laughs> So I, I think it's good to start questioning these things and unpacking what we are saying when we choose these words. <laughs> Thank you. We have several more questions that are coming in. So keep coming if you are. Okay. I don't think anyone's just joining us, but I'll say it again. If you want to ask a question, please um, type it in the Q&A box and we'll get to it. Uh, the next question for you is from Marco Polo Juarez Cruz. He says, thank you for your insightful presentation. Can you talk more about how academic scholarship from the USA uses literature to construct an idea of Latin America and the Caribbean? This comes from your mention that authors uh, such as Garcia Marquez and Octavio Paz are usually cited as emblems of national thought. Yes, that, well, that's, we're, we're working on that, trying to get this to be more inclusive too. And so often uh, literature, was selected, let's say, in book lists, you know, by people who chose what they liked and what they read. I mean, I did not read women writers when I was in graduate school. You know, Sor Juana, yes, she was allowed. Sor Juana, y nada. <laughs> and so I think that we are trying very hard. When we say canon, sometimes I think of this as a phallic figure, you know, the English canon, and that it's just male writers, but we are trying to make the idea of how to talk about the diversity of ideas within a country, perhaps the idea of a quilt is a better concept because the quilt is multicolored, multi, it had different shapes. And, and that's what I propose in one of my presentations that we should think about a quilt rather than a canon and talk about the diversity of ideas. And actually the book I wrote on Pasengarro was trying to show that Elena Garro had a different and more um, openly uh, feminist approach, even though she would never think of herself as a feminist, but her ideas were much more open towards the indigenous population than even Paz. And she did not think that the woman was the other as he poses in El Laberinto de la Soledad. So when you talk about women writers, they are introducing a different perspective that they have. And I think that the voicelessness that they for so long suffered is being changed more and more. And so the diversity of different ethnicities as well within Latin America, it's not all, uh, let's see, criollos de España, you know, the, and so we have to understand that. And I think in literature, if we choose wisely, we can see different uh, presentations of what it is. And I, one of the, I would say Ana Lidia Vega gives us this idea. And then Nicolás Guillén has a wonderful poem, perhaps you know, Problemas del Subdesarrollo, because Latin America is always thought of as underdeveloped. Well, it ain't underdeveloped in literature and culture, maybe in terms of, you know, money, but not in culture. And so what, um, uh, what Guillén does is take each of the imperial countries. And I was going to put that in as the last thing of this poem, but I didn't think I'd have time. But anyway, go to Problemas de Subdesarrollo de Nicolás Guillén. It's in English and Spanish on the web, and you will see what he is doing. He is critiquing the, the French and the Spanish and the German and the English, and their attitudes they are so superior. But can they say Aconcagua? Do they know when Jose Marti died? No. So there is a whole different cultural element that people seem to forget. 
when they're talking from their particular ethnicity or European uh, location. And again, literature can be very useful for that, I think, to open up the idea of, of what the culture is and what the ideas are, that it's not just one monolithic viewpoint in any given country. You know, that reminds me of, oh, about a few weeks ago, we had an event for the commemorating the publication of her True to Name, a, a volume oh, yeah. of, and, uh, of author, women authors from the Caribbean. And what was really noticeable is that you know, all those texts are, are translated into English if they weren't written in English, but the common themes, that common sense of, of womanness kind of crossed the boundaries of language, although it was in translation. Yeah. Right. Well, that's in um, the class that Valerie and I taught, we discovered so many similarities of the problems of the women in various countries, Guadalupe, Martinique, uh, Dominica, you know, with uh, White Sargasso Sea. So it really is showing you that gender very often is the um, powerful force that reproduces women's problems in all countries. And, and there is no one country that is predominant in that, unfortunately. Thank you. The, the next question comes from Ryan Long. Ah. Uh, he says, thanks, Sandy, for your great presentation. What might be some advantages or disadvantages of including the United States in the category of Latin America? Well, that's cool. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Um, again, you know, we often have to remind people in the United States that so much of the southern part of our country originally was Spanish speaking and part of Mexico. I think the ignorance of, uh, of history is, is appalling. And uh, that's another thing, that's one of my other projects that I'm working on right now is to show how Mexico, despite the rhetoric of our past president, is a country which had been a haven for other people. It wasn't just that the Mexico sends out immigrants, you know, but they were a place of welcoming, especially it's very famous during the Spanish Civil War. But they also have accepted people from the US, the McCarthyites who had to run away, people who were um, abused by McCarthy and his anti-communist stance. So is the US, I, I think it would be very interesting to include the US because so many writers today in the US are using their heritage, their um, background from the various Latin American countries and uh, the Caribbean and they're writing and they're enriching the US discourse. So why not? I think I wouldn't be opposed to that. <laughs> we have our own faculty actually writing these books right now, right? Laura de Maria, Sao Sosnosti, they've written works on it. Juan Carlos, you know, you have, people writing about experiences they have either within Latin America or as a person living in the US. So I think that the dialogue can be fabulous. And we should include it. I'm going to skip an, a question to go to one that's very similar. Uh, so Christopher Reed asks us, is there a sense in which the US is Caribbean? Caribbean? Um, and if we think it's about the Caribbean basin and the historical processes that have shaped it, couldn't we think of the Caribbean as perhaps definitive of the Americas? So is the exclusion or oversight of the Caribbean in various disciplines a disavowal of the Caribbean, of the colonialist and racist history that begins there? Yeah, I think it's that the colonial and racist history makes it a problem. You have to face those facts, right? But the US, I mean, geographically speaking, you see, this is the problem, I think, that if you want to talk, talk about geography for your definition, then the US cannot be. But if you want to talk about linkages, you know, there's a tremendous linkage between the US and the Caribbean. And so it would behoove us to look at that and not deny it. And just as there's a tremendous linkage between Mexico and the US. And then, of course, so many different immigrant groups come. So if we want to talk, it's not a melting pot because then you say that these are assimilated and lost, but the diversity is there and it should be recognized. And so if we talk about the U.S. and its role as a uh, lugar de, you know, ascendiendo, people want to come to the U.S. from the Caribbean for various reasons, then I think we would be broadening our idea. So as long as we define what we mean, because 
again, some people will say, oh, well, what about geography? Well, geography isn't the only thing to talk about. And the fact that you're an island isn't the only, because if you're going to talk about uh, Veracruz as part of the Caribbean basin, that's not an island. So it doesn't have to be that an island, a geographical idea is the way you define it. As long as you define your terms, I think that is important and enlightening. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'll go back to the previous question. Kara Snyder asks, well, she says, thank you for sharing your research. She's point taken that we must continue to challenge definitions, borders, and all that is taken for granted. Yeah. There are, of course, situations like the naming of a center that require deciding upon a term. So she's asked, what term would you suggest to name what it is that we do at the now titled Latin American Study Center at UMD? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I, well, <laughs> In a sense, I am no longer a faculty member. So what would I say? I think it has to do so often with the ideology of people who are involved and the reflection of their research. So I think you all would take a good hard look about what you want to say. It's not what I want to say. I think it's important to reflect on how inclusive one wants to be because there is certainly the idea that Latin America includes the Caribbean. So is it, as I said, started from the very beginning, is that a tautology or not? And uh, I have to say at any given day, I may have a different opinion depending on what we're thinking about. So I would certainly know that the colleagues at UMD will be discussing this and thinking about it. And it's important, I think, to reflect on what our profile wants to be. And certainly we would like to be inclusive and perhaps the terminology would reflect it. But we have to remember how important it is to acknowledge the diversities of language, you know, and of uh, cultural differences in what we do. Thank you. It makes you wonder about some of these different um, centers that you that you looked into, what their original ideas were when they created these centers. I know you might know about some, but not not all. No, and it, it's I think there is a sense I, I went into it because it fascinated me to see how the different parts of the country reflect it. The New Mexican one is in particularly very uh, outstanding in its difference to go into Iberian. But again, they were reflecting a history. So that's important too to reflect the history. Thank you. Jonathan Bauer asks uh, it says, I was wondering if there's also a way of discussing how language reinforces difference by saying Latin America and the Caribbean, the and seems to mark off the Caribbean, which was all, which always comes last as a yeah. state of difference and the other. Yeah, in a way, that's why some people prefer just Latin America and say to others, Latin America includes Caribbean. So I don't know, instead of and as an afterthought, Latin America, including the Caribbean or something like that. But again, if you, it, it's always a learning experience and a teaching tool. We don't have to do what people supposedly think because that may not be based on realities. You know, there's that famous saying about Dan Quayle that he said something like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know Latin when I went to Latin America. Well, he didn't say it, but it was like, oh yeah, he could have said it. So the point is that sometimes we think we are saying things that are, should be acceptable and maybe they're not. So that's a good point that you just brought out about Latin America and Caribbean. If we say it that way, is that saying they're not equal? That's something to think about. But certainly, again, if you say Latin America, and I mean also the Caribbean, is that not showing the Caribbean part? But again, it may be a tool. You say right away up front, which I did when I, I introduced, um, you know, Rastario Ferre as a uh, part of Latin America. I define my term. And that's how I, you know, justify what I was doing. I have one more question here and we'll see maybe somebody will ask another question, but um, our timing is good on this. Okay. Sabrina Gonzalez says, thank you for this wonderful talk. She's adding to the previous question on the implications of naming and renaming and says, I couldn't stop thinking that in other universities, the Latin American and Latinx studies are part of the same center. 
where uh, the what is the distinction between LASK and USLT in UMD and what it's doing, and how do you think we can <coughs> together in collaboration to um, change the disciplinary and geographical boundaries, taking into account diverse yeah. teaching research agendas of the graduate community? Yeah, it these centers always seem to come from certain um, past ideologies and needs and faculty. So I think that, uh, for example, we have Ana Patricia Rodriguez, who is part of Spanish and Portuguese, but she's also part of the US Latino and she was president of the organization. So um, sometimes because of the idea of disciplinary or, um, I don't know, administrative things, they have centers in different places, but it's up to the faculty to bring these groups together and do collaborative work. So uh, I don't know how to answer like the history of it really, but I do know that it's always part of the idea of what faculty will do and what students will do. Despite the fact that there's a um, department of X, Y, or Z, look what Valerie and I did. She's in French, I was in Spanish, we got together. And other people have gotten together along lines that in that way to show their interests how we can compare and contrast, but we can work together. And I think the more we work together, it's much better for faculty and students. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have other, give a second in, in case anyone had another question to put in the chat? Oh, I see one. Oh my, Nick, it's the same one I already had. Uh -huh. I, I, when I was reading your uh, chapter before this event, I, I was interested in the quote you brought in. Now I can't remember who it is. Uh, was it Roosevelt? About oh yes, yes. We need to stop thinking of ourselves as hyphenates, uh, German American, Irish American, and of course there's a, a list of European hyphens. But yeah. I wonder if you think that you know, will this with the demographic change in the United States that is being projected to ever increasingly levels of a latinx or hispanic depending on the terminology do you foresee do you foresee maybe a dissolution of these sort of centers if if it's just a hemispheric uh... <laughs> yeah right oh that would be interesting wouldn't it but uh again you don't want to be overwhelmed i mean not everything's the same i mean it's not all let's say there's a different discipline in comparative literature perhaps you know to say that oh global there's something called the global studies and that sort of erases everything. I do think we need to keep a certain sense of identity based on a cultural reality and acknowledge that. But again, also to show our um, ability to talk with each other. So I don't know, that'd be interesting prediction. <laughs> I have two more questions and then I think that will, that okay. will be able to wrap us up. Um, yes. I'm sure. We thank you so much. You've taken so many questions. We would just love to just. Well, yeah, I'm happy to be able to. I'm glad everyone is thinking. And I just wondered if anyone had thought in talking about the Caribbean, if they thought about Honduras or Panama or Veracruz as part of the Caribbean. Did anyone think of that? <laughs> Let's see. I can, yeah, I can, I can ask you this question, maybe if people have thoughts about that. Okay. Too. Um, one question is, how can we grapple with the differences between the research interests, conversations, scopes, etc., along the lines of those who look more at Latin America in terms of Hispanic and the Caribbean, Anglo, Francophone, etc.? How mm -hmm. can we these differences in our teaching and in the creation of an inclusive LASC? Uh, in teaching? Well, I mean, I guess the, the different, uh, the LASC classes would be able to uh, show the inclusivity. And I think that within the different departments, because of the language, I think it's still important to maintain a fluency in a language. And uh, that that does bring you into it, you can't read everything always in English translation. And as I show in that chapter too, how some of the realities of the culture are erased in a translation. So we have to understand that when we are reading and translation, we are not getting always the full picture of what the author wants. But nevertheless, we still do it because we want to at least get access to a writer 
who otherwise we would not be reading. So in a sense, there are certain courses that could address the need to show what the diversity is within one class. And I've taught them myself. We talked, um, I had one Latin American class for lost where we talked about these various iconic figures, you know, throughout the uh, history and, you know, dealing with different uh, personages. And so you can get a sense of comparison. So again, there's always this, balance that we have to do. And, and classes can address a certain point, what we want to say inclusively. And then we have classes that deal with the particular language necessities and, you know, reading in French, reading in Spanish, reading in Portuguese, reading in, no, no, not too much Dutch, but uh, recognizing that Dutch exists as part of this mix. Merle Collins says in, in your talk, you noted that LASC has for years had on its website an invitation to those interested in studying Latin American and the Caribbean. Would you think it is useful for the name to reflect this invitation and the fact that students with, the, with Caribbean interests have been attracted to the center? Or is it better in your estimation to streamline Latin America and remove the Caribbean invitation from the narrative? Oh, that's very difficult to say. I don't like to... Um... No, no me quiero meter en eso. I don't want to necessarily come up with something on this, but I do think that as long as you explain what it is, and it depends on the faculty, they have to make that decision of what they want it to say. That's how I would address that issue. I think that a name is not enough. I mean, the inclusivity would always have to be much more than just a name. You, sometimes they, people write a name and then they ignore it. So the much more valuable aspect of this discussion would be to say you will have courses that include you know all this and certainly in Spanish our courses include both writers who geographically are Latin American and geographically live in the Caribbean but we include them in the course so we are doing that already and I think that's much more important the focus that students should feel welcome to find the literature that they want to read to of a given country or whatever within the classes and make their, make their uh, desires known to say, gee, I would like to read more about this country's literature. And I think that uh, professors will respond. Or not only literature, I'm talking from my discipline, but of course, other disciplines in history, et cetera, can increase their uh, ver verbal acceptance of these areas. Thank you so much. We're getting many thanks in the chat. How do you how do you feel? You have energy for two more questions? Okay, we got yeah. two more. <laughs> two more. All right. <laughs> then, then we'll absolutely these will absolutely be the last ones. I <laughs> you said everyone's so eager to hear your hear your your uh, opinions on this. Uh, one person, said, uh, Sergio Garcia Mejia, says you explored the Latin American and the Caribbean study centers at various universities in the United States. Have you also explored how the Caribbean is studied and framed in academic centers in the Caribbean itself, but also in Central and South America? No, I haven't done that yet. No, I, I really think that would be fascinating. Oh, because in a sense, the idea of being a Latin American is a, a construct, yes, from French, and also very useful in the US. But I always remember this comment by my dear friend, Luisa Valenzuela, who's Argentine. And one time she said, Hispanic, her Hispanic, I'm nobody's Hispanic, I'm an Argentine. So again, these terms often have more meaning for us here in the States than they might have in different countries. But I think also often, you know, the idea is that within uh, Argentina or Mexico, there is now a growing interest in not only looking at their literature, their, you know, countries literature, but literature across the uh, sphere. And it, it was very interesting that one of the most important books by Luis Rafael Sanchez from Puerto Rico was published, La, um, Macho Camacho was published in Argentina, in Buenos Aires in 76. And I remember being there and getting the first copy of his book there. So again, you know, I think the different countries need to um, sort of broaden their horizons too. And it would be a very interesting study. Somebody has something to do now. 
That's right. <laughs> now here's the very last question. And we will thank you so much and, and let you let you go. But um, is there something lost? Christopher Reed asks, is there something lost in trying to overcome the heterogeneity of terms in trying to resolve the cacophony and confusion? Mm. So is there any usefulness to the terms hemispheric or the Americas? Yeah, yes, yeah, interesting. Yeah, an interesting question. Do we lose something? I think we we do lose something in, in one way if we just have this all-encompassing term. You know, and but it's interesting when you think of America. America could be an all-encompassing term, right? Is Estados Unidos de América, but you know, there's other countries that are all Americans too. So almost todos americanos. So what do you gain by just um, you know erasing all the difference? This is such a balance of always saying, you know, the importance of showing difference but knowing our commonalities. And it, it's a balancing game that we have to acknowledge and do. I think it's wrong to erase all difference in the um, idea of unity. So it, that's what I would have to say that for me, it's always been a balancing act. <laughs> Well, Dr. Seifus, thank you so very much. I know you have many comments in the chat of people oh. saying how much they're, how grateful they are for, for the stimulating presentation. Oh, so and on bad. behalf of the Latin American Studies Center, um, I'd like to thank you. Thank you all who have attended today. You will have noticed thank we you. are recording, so we should be able to make this available at a future time. But thank you all and have a, have a wonderful you. day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Good to be with you all. Thank <laughs> you.